welcome. Thanks for joining us. Aloha. <laughs> Think Jack Hawaii, rule of law and a new abnormal, whatever that may mean. And <clears throat> we have the good fortune to have with us today, Professor Emerita Familia Randall, University of Dayton School of Law and leading national and international scholar on race and racism and the law. <laughs> Jeff Portnoy, partner at Cade Shuddy and former University of Hawaii Regent and constitutional and First Amendment law expert. And David Larson, <clears throat> recent chair of the American Bar Association section of dispute resolution, now the immediate past chair and professor at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul. <clears throat> David, so how's the nurses strike there? What's going on? Well, as you may know, it's the largest nurses strike in American history. So um, it's, <laughs> to put it bluntly, it's worrisome. Um, you know, there's no way you can lose that many healthcare providers at one time and not have that impact patient care. What's interesting about this strike, and I've been following it, is that as I'm listening to the president of the Minnesota Nurses Association and listening to her speak, and I've followed a number of strikes over, over the years, um, and you hear anger, you hear frustration. Um, what I'm hearing now in her voice is, is a strong sense of desperation. Um, 37,000 healthcare workers have left um, in the last couple of years, left the profession. Uh, for a variety of reasons, exposure to COVID, um, being overworked. But every time a healthcare provider leaves, that means it's more work for the remaining ones. And it's gotten really difficult for the nurses that are still working. Um, they're having to work extended shifts and really they're just exhausted. And right now, I think the reason they're on strike is uh, they've just hit a boiling point. They, they're at their wits end. They don't know what to do. They're exhausted. They've been risking their lives for a couple of years. Um, they've they've been angels. Um, they've come to work uh, under circumstances when other people may not have come to their jobs. I just think they've been terrific, uh, but they're exhausted. And we're in a real crisis situation because on the one hand, um, they want better scheduling, fewer hours, uh, more pay. But on the other hand, uh, the healthcare organizations, the hospitals have had to suspend elective surgeries, um, cosmetic surgeries, nobody's getting those jobs over the pandemic. Um, and a lot of the income that they were getting for a lot of these elective surgeries has gone away. So um, their income has gone down. But if you are losing people, you need to be able to attract them. And that might, might mean higher wages, number one. And if your current workers are dissatisfied and are threatening to leave, it might need to pay higher wages, number two. And now we've got this very difficult situation where we, it's, it doesn't seem possible we're going to increase income flow in the short term, but there are very strong financial demands um, to make the healthcare situation better for the nurses. So yeah, it's a, it's a really troubling situation. The one thing that might help is that you know sometimes this can help in lieu of any kind of wage increases that nurses have been asking for more input and control over the scheduling that uh, they'd like to have more cooperative committees set up so they can they can dictate a little more uh, when and where they're going to have to work and if the healthcare organizations the hospitals can be a little more lenient on that a little more open to allowing more self government in terms of scheduling maybe maybe that can. Uh, diffuse the situation. David, I have a question. Uh, I haven't really followed the nurses' strike, but I've been having taught healthcare law as something that I, I am really familiar with in terms of the stresses. And one of the questions I have, because I, I feel like profit and nonprofit hospitals and organizations do this trick. They talk about income coming in as a reason for uh, not being able to increase wages. But at the same time, they have these huge financial reserves. Oh. And, and the question I always have is, okay, your income's not coming in, but draw from your financial reserve. 
this is a crisis, you know, uh, what are the financial reserves of the hospitals and uh, people in, in, in your area? Do you know that? We don't know the financial reserves, but it, it's, thank you for bringing up the point of finances, because one thing that actually has been very troubling is that as with many entities in the United States, when you look at the multiples of what CEO salaries are compared to the average worker, the latest report had it at 324 times the median wage. And so you've got healthcare workers who are hearing the explanation I just said about the financial pressures who are also looking at administrators and executives, at least at the high end, that are getting paid very well still, um, multi-million dollar salaries. Uh, and they're saying, that you're telling me no money's available, but yet you're paying. And those salaries actually have gone down during the pandemic um, as much as 25%. Um, uh, but they're saying still, you're still resting at $2 million a year, $3 million a year. And we're well below $100,000 a year. So that's another reason we're, why we're out on this picket line is because of that, that pay and and um, yeah, so that's playing into that too, Professor Randall. Well, now that Biden settled the rail strike, you can get on a train and get to Minnesota and settle the nurses strike. It's that easy. Well, hopefully that'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, is the is there a mediation service involved in that one for the labor negotiations? Well, so it's, you know, it's, it's unlike with the rail strike and the railway lay. So with the rail in the railroad industry, the national mediation board, and, um, you know, so, and there are some mediation obligations uh, that are statutory, it doesn't exist under the national labor relations board, they're not the same obligations. So one of the calls by the hospitals, and there's 15 hospitals that, that are being struck, which actually ended last night. It was a free, it, it's a, it's a situation that it almost was thrown down the gauntlet. Nurses went on strike for three days. And um, to kind of demonstrate that we're serious about this, we're not going to go out and strike for an extended period. We've been without a contract for, for six months, which is true. That's also been frustrating. So they said, okay, we just want to show you that we're serious. We're going out for three days. And that ended last night. And they're back at work at, at a lot of the hospitals, but saying that this is a warning and we can go out again the next time and it might not be for just three days. So one of the one of the calls for the hospitals is that we haven't done enough mediation. We have to do more mediation. And what the union is saying is that we need to get a little closer on these huge, broad requests before mediation will even be productive. We don't think we think that we're so far apart that going into mediation would be a waste of time because uh, a mediator is not going to be able to pull us together. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. I, I guess I'm not convinced of that. I think a mediator can always help. But um, but uh, unlike the situation with the railroads, there isn't the statutory um, requirement for mediation uh, under the NLRA that there is under the Railway Labor Act. So, Jeff, you followed labor for years. and. It sounds like one of the things that may be a little different than the traditional compensation and benefits negotiations is now that workload and resources uh, are becoming a major problem in not only healthcare, but in the air transportation industry, in teaching and education, and maybe across the board. How does that, is that happening and how does that change things in labor? Well, I, I really can't talk about what's happening other places, but all you have to do is look at Hawaii. We have more tourists now than we've ever had over the last four months. And our tourism workforce is down, depending upon who you talk to and what you read, 20 to 25 percent, particularly at the, at the hotels. So, I mean, there's there's a disconnect somewhere because the hotel rates in Hawaii now are the highest in the United States and very close to being the highest in the world. All you have to do is go online and see what it costs now to get a hotel room in Hawaii and then understand that the workforce has been reduced by a fifth or a fourth, depending upon who you talk to. So, you know, you have to fight to get your rooms clean because they haven't wanted to rehire. 
the uh, you know the the, the housekeepers. Uh, you have to park your own car because they haven't hired the valets. Uh, you're lucky you can get a reservation at a hotel restaurant or any restaurant in Hawaii for that matter now these days because they can't get staff. So, you know, there's a new paradigm and, and you know, you can blame it on COVID. It's very convenient. A lot of people do. Uh, but I think, you know, it, it's a number of factors depending upon the industry. Um, you know, I, I represent lots of doctors, including lots of ER doctors. And over the last two years, I've I've heard multiple horror stories about lack of staffing in emergency rooms and, and what's going on uh, here. I can't talk about other places. Wait times, uh, the fact that the homeless are using the ER as their personal physicians on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, then you hear the hospitals cry, as David just suggested, that, you know, they don't have the, the resources. So, I don't know. I mean, maybe we'll become like Europe, where major industries will go on strike for a month until the public decides that they can't live with it anymore. And, you know, I mean, spend any time in Italy or, or England or France where every day you wake up wondering, all right, who's going on strike today? The postal workers, the uh, baggage handlers. I mean, the disruption is unbelievable. I was in England when they went on strike in London on, on, the, on the subways. It, it was brutal. And, uh, you know, they were out for a long time. So uh, David, David's the mediator and probably has been involved in these negotiations. I've been tangentially involved, actually represented the nurses here at one point on something quasi related. So um, I don't have any answers. I just look at the situation. And so I don't know, you know, look, unions were dying. Right? Three or four years ago, the number of union memberships were way, way, way down, and they had virtually no power. And then in the last couple of years, there's been a rebirth, you say that's good or bad. A McDonald's, Amazon, uh, you know, a Walmart, uh, you know, facing all these Starbucks, facing all these unionizations. And, you know, it, it seems to be in transition again. Uh, so who knows? Well, one of the things is the, I, I'm so happy to see the unionization and the strikes because the working conditions for American workers, it, uh, the, uh, low and middle level workers, is horrific. Uh, no hour contracts, uh, scheduling people in a way where they working less than 30 hours a week, but they're not, they don't have a set schedule and they have to be available for people uh, paying wages so low that people qualify for welfare and for Medicare. Uh, our, the working conditions for people in America is, is horrific. And it's largely because we haven't really had uh, strong unions. We don't even have to have it across the board. Just like, I think if 15 to 20% of the population was unionized and struck, I think that would drive up conditions uh, in 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 the whole in across the board, but there's a reason people are striking, and uh, until people want to get off their profits and their high wages on the high end, I think it's going to continue because people have horrible working conditions. Yeah, one of the one of the kind of the impetus for the National Labor Relations Act. We'll go back to Woodrow Wilson, who said that. Um, the unionization uh, supports the, the democratization of industry in the workplace. And uh, I think that's part of the impulse for unionization right now, that uh, the schedules, as Professor Randall says, the schedules we're being offered and demanded to follow are exhausting. And we, we just feel we need to have more control over our own lives and our work schedules and the demands. Um, in the railroad industry, <clears throat> one reason they that's that's they, the railroad workers went on strike is that 
uh, again, as, as Jeff says, the workforces have shrunk across the country and there are not enough railroad workers and people are being asked to work very long hours, long consecutive days. Um, so not only long hours per day, but many days in succession. And, uh, and what they're in, they've got a kind of an odd attendance system where they're penalized for any time away from work, including health visits. And if you get COVID, um, all this runs against you and you're going to be penalized for um, any kind of absence. And uh, the feeling is that that's that's impossible. You know, we we have life threatening diseases and we're being penalized on our employment when we have no control over it. We need to go on strike so that we have a voice and we can fix some of these conditions. So part of what's happening with the unionization is this recognition that as employers are putting more demands on because of a shrinking workforce, that they're pretty much helpless unless they speak with a collective voice and um, and do things like uh, go on strike. Yeah, well, and it sounds like the part of the movement has been from the traditional compensation and benefits disputes. Certainly in the last 40 years with increasing income inequality and it just egregiously unequal distribution of wealth that that's now become an issue as well as the resources and the choices of the workers themselves. But a lot of work was shown by the pandemic to be capable of being done remotely. And there are a lot of people that would greatly prefer that. But you look, you know, the irony here is, and this may be a little bit of an overstatement, but I don't think it's much of an overstatement. Trump's supporters, if you look at it by economic breakdown and education, far more are in the lower demographics of income and education. And he's the same president who was so anti-labor and appointed his own cronies to the Labor Relations Board and all the other related federal agencies that deal with issues like this, there's a tremendous irony because they support the politics of a president who is in favor of all the things that they don't want. Low wages, uh, you know, too much pay for CEOs and, uh, you know, administrators. There's a tremendous irony there uh, because, you know, and you can agree or disagree with the politics, the Democrats have always been pro-labor, maybe too much, in my view, in other people's views. But on the opposite end, the Republicans have been the exact opposite, at least in recent memory. So, you know, they have to either vote with their pocketbook or vote for the social policies they want. And right now, they're not voting with their pocketbook. Yeah, why? You know, I, I speculate on this, and I certainly don't pretend to be an expert. <laughs> And they think, well, you know, why is it? And what Jeff is saying is absolutely true. That when you look um, at the red states and the populations that are supporting Trump, um, they tend to be the lesser educated, lower income individuals. And you ask, how can that be? Because the policies are hurting them. And what I've speculated is that um, Trump also presents a kind of a f philosophy of discrimination and hate. And um, uh, and that there are people who are making the choice that even though this is going to cost me financially, I feel so much better if I, if my worst instincts are improved, approved and emboldened, that it's worth it for me. I mean, the, you know, if I get to be a, a bigot and a racist, and that's okay, the leaders say that's okay. Well, then the fact that it's going to cost me some money, that's I'm okay with that with that trade. You know, there is there is one thing that he plays on, and I'll, I'll defer to the presser in a second. He does pander to those voters by saying, the reason you're not getting more than $9 or $10 an hour is because they're hiring all these African-Americans and illegal aliens who have taken all your low-paying jobs. <laughs> That's why you're not getting 15 bucks an hour. <laughs> and it's a... 
it's a strategy that has historically worked. I mean, we look at Trump as a, and, and his supporters as if they are somehow different. But if we look at the history of the United States, white people and the whole concept of whiteness is something born out of the law here in the United States. I mean, I, I'm not discounting the historic uh, the issues of how race was formed, but the concept of whiteness was formed here in the United States in 1792, when the United States first passed the first immigration law that said you cannot come to this country unless you're white. And what that resulted in is people who here to before who didn't identify as white, but French or German or Australian or, or whatever, saying, hey, I'm white. Uh, let me in. It's, it resulted in a huge number of cases in litigation. People saying, I was denied entry because they said I'm not white. I am biologically white. Don't look at my skin color. Look at my biological connection. So that concept of whiteness started at the beginning and has been something that po 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 politicians have appealed to throughout our history. I'll tell you one Look other thing. Ignore, yeah. ignore your, ignore your interests, I, I, and 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 uh, support the people who will protect your whiteness. Yeah, I was going to say that it, it may take a little too long, but. Um, when Norwegian cruise lines came out to Hawaii, they were able to sail within the islands, uh, despite the Jones Act, uh, because they made an arrangement that they would hire uh, a certain large percentage of Americans. And if you've been on cruise ships anywhere else, you know, 95% are Indonesian and Filipino and Eastern Europeans. Well, I know this because I was their lawyer. They soon learned that young Americans weren't willing to do the work that was necessary for the pay they were getting. That wasn't what they were used to. And so there was a real problem in staffing the ship. Uh, and, and so that's part of it too. I mean, you know, it's like, I'm not gonna work for 10 bucks an hour. And so who fills the void, right? People who are willing to work for $10 an hour because they've come to this country because they were making nothing where they were. So, I mean, there's a real dilemma, particularly in the service industries. Yeah, Professor Randolph mentions people ignoring their interests um, to protect their whiteness. And I'm, I'm not, I, I, I would maybe even frame it a little differently, that, that one of people's interests, given human nature, is to feel better about yourself by putting down other people. I mean, that's one of our interests. It's a, it's a, it's a base, ugly interest, but it's, it is, I think it's part of being a human being. So, and it's a powerful, it's a powerful drive. And I think what is happening is that that's such a powerful drive. And it's so comforting to me to know that it's okay for me to feel like that and say that and act that way that if that's going to cost me some income, it's going to cost me some luxuries. I don't care. I'd rather I'd rather have that trade. So so you ask why would you follow a politician who's going to hurt you financially, hurt your retirement, hurt the you know your wages, hurt you in all kinds of different ways? Because I'm getting this other thing. This other thing is very comforting to me, and uh, I'm willing to to lose over here to gain over here. And that's a great insight, the connection to the identity politics <clears throat> and the workplace conditions as a part of the identity of entire sectors of people, Black, Latinx, Native American, and others. <clears throat> and the question of whether there may be more choice now and so one of the questions is looking historically, 
we saw that after the last major recession, depression, when FDR came in. And some of the same measures is stimulus, infrastructure building, and employment at levels where it had not previously been supplemented. Are those things going to help? Are they going to make a difference? I think they've only make only marginal difference for the black community, because I think that they're going to be implemented in a colorblind way, which we, and in a racist society, whenever you start a program that's supposed to be colorblind, but supposed to affect everyone equitably, uh, people's biases, people's uh, conscious and unconscious bias, programs design all work to continue racial discrimination. And, and so I think that they're not going to have, notwithstanding the, the, the Democrats uh, saying that the idea is to deal with some of the historical uh, 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 racial wealth problems. I I think that in the end, it's only going to be marginal, and not just for blacks, for Latinx, and and for Asian Americans, and for Native Americans as well. You know, you think low unemployment is is going to help things because everybody will be able to get a job, be able to raise themselves up. Um, low employment, low unemployment is usually the way you pull yourself out of recession. Um, but the problem is that a lot of these jobs being created are not particularly attractive jobs. Um, they are not high paying jobs. They're not very rewarding work and they're difficult and they're strenuous and sometimes dangerous. So even though we might be encouraged when we see unemployment numbers, when you look a little deeper, um, sometimes those numbers are uh, a little more revealing as to whether or not that's gonna be our way out. And right now it doesn't seem to be because uh, we do have those low unemployment numbers, and yet we're not getting uh, a sense of satisfaction and comfort in our communities. Um, people aren't coming back to work. So uh, that alone isn't the solution. So in our last minute or so, your thoughts on where all this is likely headed, Jeff? All this? What's this? <laughs> Working in living racism, conditions. Racism, uh, unemployment, uh, strikes. I mean, wealth disparity. I mean, uh, you know, look, the more things change, the more things remain the same. And you go back and look at history as the professor has done. We go through cycles and uh, we're going through another cycle. You know, we've had this pandemic and that is new since 1917 and 18, really. And we'll see how the country comes out of it. I mean, the good news is we're only six weeks away from an election. And I've talked about this before, where those of us who were very worried about losing complete control of the federal government are now feeling very optimistic that at least we won't lose the Senate. And who knows what's going to happen in the House? So, you know, all is not lost, but are things going to change dramatically one way or the other? I, I doubt it. There'll be ebbs and flows. That That's my view. Professor Randall, your thoughts? I agree. I don't think things will change dramatically. And I think largely because the Democrats are going to be unwilling to make changes in how the Senate operates so that they can do stuff that are dramatic. I, you know, there's there are good reasons not to vote for mega Republicans. But there's also the hope that the Democrats are going to make a difference is a misplaced hope. Uh, they're going to do marginally better, but not make a significant difference. Uh, the, the unemployment rate among African Americans continues to run twice as much as whatever the 
unemployment rate is for whites. And that's not because African-Americans don't look for jobs and don't want jobs and don't try to get jobs and won't take a job because of the wages. It's because they don't get offered jobs, don't get hired, don't get interviewed. Uh, and and so they uh, so so that's not going to make much of a difference. I don't think the elections are going to make a much of a difference with that. David, closing thoughts. Well, I hope that I, I always like to try and be a little optimistic, and I'm hoping that when the fact that we're seeing, for example, unionization taking hold in industries where it never existed before, was never in the Amazon warehouses, wasn't in all these fast food franchises, that 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 employers will stop and think, why is this happening? And what can I do to avoid this and make the workers more comfortable um, so we're not so adversarial? I, I'd like to think that there'll be an epiphany that we can actually voluntarily make things better um, rather than going into labor strife. And uh, that's what I'd like to see. That's a great note to finish on. Thanks so much, Professor Randall, David, Jeff, all of you who have joined us or will join us to view this. Come back again in a couple of weeks. We'll be back. More issues, more choices, more questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.